Hello, and welcome to today's program, Emotional Appetite, the Food and Mood Connection. My name is Lori Wellner, and I'm a health and food safety educator for K-State Research and Extension in Wyandotte County. Now, just a little side note, you'll want to make sure that the volume is up on your computer before we move ahead. There's been a great deal of information and research that has emerged over the years regarding the connection between food, our mind and our bodies, and how it impacts the way we eat, and even think about food, and ultimately how it affects our health. This is just a reminder that all K-State research and extension programming is open to all people. This is the publication that accompanies this lesson. I will be covering most of the concepts today, but you still might want to download this for yourself or email me and I can send it your direction. There are so many factors that determine what and how much we eat and some are listed here. I'm certain that you can think of others not on this list, but really these have nothing to do with our physical hunger. And if we give in to these influences over time, it will impact our health. A question I like to ask when teaching this lesson is, what did you learn about eating and food as a child? Was food a reward? Did you have the clean plate syndrome? Did you get dessert only after eating everything on your plate? These also make a difference in how we think about food. So the first step is to understand that our consumption, our food consumption is influenced by more than just being truly hungry and secondly, it is to develop an awareness of those influences that cause us to eat. Sometimes we simply just need to be more aware of what it feels like to be truly hungry, and on the other side of that, what it feels like to be truly full. On the first page of that publication I referred to, it asked participants, it asked you to describe being very specific in the spaces provided, or just to think about it what it feels like to be hungry, and again, what it feels like to be full. These next two slides reveal just that. The dictionary describes hunger as, quote, the painful sensation or state of weakness caused by the need of food, unquote. So here are some other descriptors, feeling that emptiness or the void or, or hollowness in your stomach, hearing that growling and rumbling sound, maybe feeling lightheaded or dizzy or even shaky, you become easily irritated, your energy is low, you have difficulty concentrating on tasks, you may even feel nauseated, even disoriented, and, and some people get headaches. Now again, on the other side, you have that description of fullness, which is just very simply you're satisfied. You don't really care to eat another bite. But if you go in excess, you will you know, have that feeling of being stuffed, even having that uncomfortable or discomfort, possibly fatigue and sluggishness, and you just really become disinterested. When you understand the differences between hunger and fullness, you can be more in tune to situations that cause you to crave certain foods, especially when you aren't hungry. And this is called emotional eating. So what are some emotional triggers? This slide addresses a couple, time of day or evening. For example, is it automatic for you to eat lunch at the stroke of, at the stroke of noon, even if you're not hungry? Or do you always have to have that bowl of ice cream before bed, even though you still might be full from dinner? Does stress send you running to the refrigerator? Well, an easy definition of emotional eating is when you consume food or drinks for that matter to offset or feed an emotion. There are some triggers and some are listed here, stress, depression, loneliness, frustration, anxiety, and anger. But most commonly, people eat when they aren't hungry out of boredom and when they are just putting off something, when they procrastinate. And again, I'm sure there's others that you can add to this list. The connection between our mind and body is real, and it includes the foods we crave. 
we know that there are certain chemicals in the brain that affect our appetite as well as our mood. For example, stress causes an elevation in the brain's chemicals, galanine and neuropeptide Y. That increases the desire for fatty types of foods and carbohydrates. Stress also tends to magnify these cravings. Therefore, some stressed people may eat a lot of chocolate, for example, because it has those carbohydrates and that fat combination. The carbohydrate in the form of sugar in the chocolate causes a release of serotonin and endorphins, which improve mood and provide that feeling of pleasure. The more pleasure you experience, the more you continue to indulge in whatever it is that provided that. And in this case, it's chocolate. The fat in the chocolate satisfies the elevated galamine levels. It's a tricky domino effect that can ultimately lead to overeating. When I teach this face-to-face, -face, I have participants take part in, that, in an activity, and I wanna give credit to one of our Master Food volunteers for sharing it with me. But they take a soft chocolate mint and wrap the candy and they set it aside without taking a bite. And then I continue on with the program while the candy is sitting there in front of them. And then we stop and we talk about what's going on. What were they experiencing? A lot of people say my mouth was watering or I was distracted and I couldn't track what you were talking about. And then I have them pick up the candy and take a very small bite off the corner and really focus on the taste and the smell and the mouthfeel, basically savoring the candy mindfully. I have them repeat it and we talk about which bite, was it the first or the second, was more satisfying, and then they can finish eating it if they want. The intent is to illustrate that the first two bites are the most satisfying, and then after that, it becomes less fulfilling and enjoyable. There's a list of chemicals, and they're right here, in the brain that are associated with the appetite, and we'll talk about each one of these in more detail. The first two are the dopamine and norepinephrine. These are released after eating high protein types of foods. And there are some illustrations here. And to this, I would also add soy products. High levels of these chemicals um, produce an, an increase in alertness. It aids in our concentration and helps to manage stress. But low levels, can lead to depressed feelings, an increase in our irritability, and really just messes with our mood. Endorphins, we know commonly are released during exercise and possibly released after eating sugary and fatty types of foods. High levels produce that euphoric or that pleasurable feeling, but low levels drive us to seek pleasure through consumption of junk foods, perhaps excessive exercise, and even alcohol intake. And so foods implicated are cakes and candies like the chocolate you see here, cookies, and sweets. The galanine, this is triggered by stress. High levels increase our desire to eat, often creamy types of foods, such as chip dip or shakes or ice cream. Um, chips and french fries, which would give us that salty and perhaps crunchy. You have the chocolate, which again is that combination of sweet and fat, and fatty types of meat, which blend different types of mouthfeel. The next one is a neuropeptide Y, which is triggered by stress. And it, it increases our desire for those carbohydrate-rich foods, such as breads, and pastas, and rice, um, and so much more, and there's some good illustrations here. Serotonin is released after eating and, and, and also eating carbohydrates, which includes those not only just whole grains, which are better choices, but also the refined grains, uh, those veggies and fruits, and also sweets. High levels improve our mood, satisfies our cravings, and lessens the feelings of depression and increases relaxation and calmness. Low levels, however, can cause insomnia, 
it can lead to depression, it can move us towards aggressive behavior, and increase our food cravings. Now, I found this from the American Heart Association. Actually, there's quite a bit of information out there on foods that boost your mood. But I like this because it's very simple. The first one, fruits and vegetables. And you've heard the adage, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, and maybe other doctors too. But they note here that fruits and vegetables have been linked to higher levels of happiness. The omega-3s are found in foods like fish and nuts. Now, low levels in this case have been linked to de depression and impulsiveness. So you want to make sure that for various reasons that you keep a good source of omega-3s in your diet. In your diet. Chocolate um, is that special treat, of course, in moderation, and it's all about the right type of chocolate. So you want to choose one that is 70% dark chocolate or higher to obtain the most flavonols and has minimal amount of ingredients. So read those labels. So let's take a look at the differences between our emotional and our physical hunger. Quite simply, when you're eating out of an emotion, it comes on suddenly and you do so to feed a feeling, whatever it's happy, sad, etc. And you usually crave a specific food, often something sweet or salty. And regardless of your fullness, you're gonna eat. Physical hunger, on the other hand, comes on gradually, you know it's happening, and you eat to feed that void in your stomach. And you don't really have any specific cravings. And when you're full or you're satisfied, you stop. In the publication that I mentioned on page two, it asked to part, excuse me, it had asked you to identify three emotions and foods you typically eat when those emotions occur. These pictures here depict different types of emotions from stress on the left to boredom on the right, as well as situations that might elicit eating when you're not hungry, such as just simply seeing a picture in an advertisement, for example, or maybe smelling the, the waif of food from a fast food restaurant. Or certainly when we gather together, social gathering, there is always food. Being aware of how your feelings lead to eating is so critical so that you can possibly plan ahead and break that chain. So in short, be mindful of the connection between your moods and food. Now this is a list of key words, and you see happy and angry, anxious, hurt, and sad, with other ways to describe that main feeling. And sometimes we just need to be able to identify or label our feeling. It may take a while for you to learn how to distinguish between physical and emotional hunger. So whenever you have a desire to eat something outside of your planned meal time, do a self check to determine your hunger level. If you are not experiencing any of those signs that we identified earlier that describes your hunger, wait a few minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to see if that desire goes away. Cravings associated with emotional hunger may go away when you distract yourself, for example, but symptoms associated with that physical hunger will intensify if you ignore it. Here are some tips that you can try if you suspect that you are experiencing emotional hunger. They're just different distractions, I guess. Exercising certainly because of the release of those endorphins, which improve our mood. Uh, distractions of reading a book or just associating with a person calling somebody, doing some light cleaning, which is not, not a big fan of, um, brushing your teeth, which is pretty effective actually, um, and, and perhaps just drink some water. It may be as simple as drinking some water because sometimes people mistake their thirst for hunger. Physical activity is of utmost importance. We know it helps to relieve stress and anxiety and increase 
our mood, improve our mood. It helps to reduce the risk of some chronic diseases and it overall just improves our health and our energy. Adults just simply need to move more and sit less throughout the day. Some physical activity I've always said is better than none, so get moving. Adults who sit less and do any amount of activity, moderate to vigorous physical activity, gain some benefits. The physical activity guidelines for adults is to get at least 30 minutes of moderate activity most days of the week. So walk, garden, dance, whatever you enjoy so that you will stick with it. Just get moving. And adults should also um, do some strength training um, activities at least twice a week. Here's an illustration of the My Plate. It's a helpful visual proportionately dividing the food group with the vegetable group um, being the largest of the plate. In that, you'll also include those whole grains, fruits, lean protein, and low fat dairy. Ideally, you want to move towards consuming less of these types of foods, which are high in calories, sugar, and fat, many of which we mentioned when we talked about the brain chemicals and, and how they're associated with our appetite. So you can see the whole list from your sweets and sugary beverages um, in sports drinks also because of the high amount of sugar and calories. Smart beverage choices would include your 100% vegetable and fruit juice, so you must read the label. Coffee in its simplest form without all the added extras, which add calories and sugar. Low fat dairy products, tea, and then don't forget water. I just want to thank you for joining me for today's program, Emotional Appetite, the Food and Mood Connection. Please don't hesitate to contact me by phone or email and check out our website for additional information. With that, and in closing, I'll simply say, take care of yourself physically and emotionally through making healthy food choices, eating intentionally and mindfully, and getting regular activity.